friends, welcome back. Yeah, this is a special week. It really is a special week. I'm really enjoying it. Yes. Special. So it's special. Special. So friends, special. before we get going into what we're going to be doing, let's check in with our zones. Okay. Zones are so important. They are. They really help us frame our day and get us in the right mindset mm -hmm. or help us identify a problem that we can then solve. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Kenneth, what zone are you in today? Hmm. Green zone. I'm not shocked by that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It, you know what? I just love springtime. It is the best. You know, love I, have, I have a secret. Okay. I don't like spring. You don't like spring? Why not? I have really bad allergies. Oh. When I was a student, they were so bad that I couldn't go out to recess unless I had goggles on. Oh, no. Oh. And so I'd have to go around recess with swimming goggles on. Imagine how that went, friends. Mm -hmm. Yikes. And I like wake up and my eyes are swollen shut. Oh, I have really, no. really, really bad springtime allergies. And so yeah. spring is not my favorite Spring's season. rough. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. But I have to stay inside a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, Mrs. Wally, does that put you in a yellow zone today? No, not today. I'm doing okay today. The stuff okay. that I'm allergic to hasn't quite bloomed yet. So, uh -huh. I'm getting it's to coming. enjoy the beautifulness, <laughs> but it is coming. Yep. Yeah, it's coming. Oh. How are you, Miss Alpha? I'm good. I'm like Mr. Kevin. I uh, am not an allergy sufferer, so I get to enjoy being outside in the springtime. And I am so happy for that mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> and I was, dri as I was driving into TV classroom today, mm -hmm. just. The sun was shining, it was blue skies, and I had a view of the port of Tacoma, and it was just beautiful. And it just, I took a deep breath and just said, I am lucky I live here. Yes. So, okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Shall we tell them? Let's review our three personal standards first. Okay. Okay. So today and every day when we all come together, because we have all of you today, we have first, second, Everybody. third, fourth, and fifth graders For this. today. This is the first time this week. Is this this is, is the, the first, first time this week. Yeah. It's not the last. So <laughs> let's all say our three personal standards. Show, Show respect, respect. Make, make good decisions, decisions. Solve problems. problems. So we are all together today because we are going on a field trip. Yay, field trip. Field trips are especially important for us to adhere to our three personal standards. Oh, most definitely. Because we're not in our own space. Mm -mm. Nope. We're in the space of other professionals, experts, mm -hmm. and plants and animals. And this field trip, we're going to be in nature. We are going to be in nature. Mm -hmm. Just like at the Tacoma Nature Center, when yeah. we thought about how we can show respect mm -hmm. by having a calm body, having calm voices. Being careful where we walked. If we disturbed something, putting it back where it was. Mm -hmm. Keeping our space from wildlife mm -hmm. to allow them to do their natural thing. Mm -hmm. We're going to do all of those things. So important. And you are going to make good decisions when you have your science notebook out yes. and open yep. and you're writing and drawing your observations or your questions. Right, because you're going to be responsible for either turning that into your teacher or putting it on Flipgrid. Put it on Flipgrid. There'll be a Flipgrid for yep. everybody. And we're going to put it on there and so we can all see what everybody saw. Because you yep. know what? The great thing about learning in a group is that everybody takes something different from the situation. So it's really yeah. great to see other people's perspectives. And you know who I learned that from last week? Who? Our friend Story, who sent us an email with yes. her. Yes. She's a fifth grader. And she sent us a picture of the phenomenon that fifth graders were looking at, which was the whales. And oh, she my noticed goodness. barnacles on the whales that we didn't notice. I hadn't even noticed it. Mm -mm. And then they took it to another level. Yes, they did. Do you know what they did, friends? They researched it. Mm -hmm. They found more information. They sent us that information. They drew on the picture to show us what they were talking about. They sent us links to pictures and then asked some more questions. And so then I responded back with some questions I had. Mm -hmm. And now we're both researching those new questions. We're being scientists over email and stories getting to do it with the TV classroom teacher. And it all just started with one photo. It was just one picture, one wondering. And they felt really, really compelled to tell us about it. Mm -hmm. And oh man, amazing. It was amazing. So the rest of you can do that as well by sending us your noticings, your wonderings, mm -hmm. and we can do some research together. Yep. So we're going to do all of those things. Oh, should we tell them where we're going? Oh yeah, we forgot to tell you where we're going. Huh. Mr. Kevin, did you have, were you wondering I, where we're going to? So, well, yes, I am <laughs> wondering where we're going. But the other thing I wanted to know was, uh, so 
uh, how, how so so Flipgrid? How does that work? So what they do? There's a link that I've posted for teachers. They also have the join code. So either way, you can get in. You click on the link. You put in your school email address, and then it opens up, and you click on your grade level, and then there there'll be little conversations. It'll say episode 504 or 106 or whatever your grade levels is. And you click on the episode that matches the video you're watching. And then you'll see a little video of me talking. And I will ask you a question. And then below that, there's a little comment bar with a red circle with um, a, what word am I trying to like say? Like a video camera? Thank you, a mm -hmm. video camera in it. So you can either type a comment or you can click record and you can record your own Flipgrid you don't have to have your face showing. Mm -hmm. My face isn't showing in any of them. I use pictures and little stickers and things to make the graphic. And then that responds to my question. And then all of us can look at it and see. So this would be a wonderful opportunity for our, our students to interact directly on the show with yes. you. Yes. And is, with each other. And with each other to use Flipgrid. And, and we would play those Flipgrid comments, oh, right? Oh, yeah. if they wanted us if to. If they yeah. wanted and us to. Yeah. They can talk to other students in the same grade level at other schools. Yeah. Oh. How cool is that? That's very cool, mm -hmm. teachers. And we also have one for Miss Teresa. For art. So when Miss Teresa does her art, mm -hmm. we have a channel or it's called a topic, right? It's called a topic. A topic where you can respond to Miss Teresa or ask her questions, or you could ask her to show you how to draw something that you aren't uh -huh. sure how to draw. And you could take a picture or show a video of the art you created with Miss Teresa. Mm -hmm. It's pretty great. She's really looking forward to it. She really would love to see your art. Yeah. I'm flipping for Flipgrid. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, Mr. Kevin. Okay. Hey, where maybe, are we going? Maybe next week we can go on Flipgrid on a TV classroom and show students. That's a good idea. So oh, then they can see what it idea. looks like for those yeah. who don't know. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. All right. Well, where are we going? Oh, yeah. Where are we going? Where are we going? We are going to join two experts, Chris and Leica, uh -huh. with the Pierce Conservation District, and we are going to Swan Creek. Swan Creek. Which is in Lister's backyard. Amazing. So for our students who go to Lister, we're gonna be right by your school. It's gonna be really close to where you go to school. That's awesome. Yeah, it's gonna be really neat. They're gonna talk to us a lot about the plants and animals, mm -hmm. more specifically about the plants that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna teach us about native and non-native plants and why it's important to know which is which and what you and I can do to support our salmon who aren't actually in Swan Creek, but they're gonna help us make that connection. Well, they're not there yet. Right. Fifth graders, that's a little hint. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Okay. I guess we'll see them in nature at Swan Creek. We'll see you. I got to get my rubber boots on first. Me too. I have them in my car. <laughs> All right, friends. We'll see you there. See you there. Bye. Hi, Tacoma. Here we are at Swan Creek, just like we said. And we're here with Chris and Leica. And they're going to give us a tour of this amazing area. We're going to do a lot of noticing about the different plants and be making some connections between what we're seeing here and what we've been learning about classifying plants and classifying animals and our salmon and the Salish Sea. I wonder if our friends at home know where this is. Oh. Could you tell us exactly where we are and what we expect to see? Definitely. So we're here at Swan Creek Park. We're at the Pioneer Way entrance. And right here, we are just a short distance from where Swan Creek enters the Puyallup River and then goes into Commencement Bay in Puget Sound. So right, we're right between Puyallup and Tacoma right now. If we were to walk up the trail, we'd make our way up to places like uh, Lister Elementary and First Creek Middle School. Lister? <laughs> Some of you go to Lister. We're in your backyard. Can you believe it? So is this an area that Lister students or any students could come visit anytime they wanted? Definitely, you can park down here at the Pioneer Way entrance or you can enter from up in the park. There's a community garden space by the school and you can enter the trails in the upland area and walk all the way down here for sure. Very neat. So it's springtime here. There's a lot of different, I'm seeing a lot of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we expecting to see today? Yeah, we can expect a lot of things now that spring's out and everything's blooming. 
Um, so we might see some cool buds or flowers on all these different plants or just the little leaves. They're really happy. But yeah, last fall we actually came and saw some salmon though, but we won't see any today, I don't, I don't think. Maybe some bugs. Yeah, some bugs I know too. that springtime means lots of bugs. Very cool. So where are we going to go first? So we're gonna walk up the trail here. We're just gonna see what kind of plants we notice and maybe talk about why it's good to see some plants and maybe not so good to see some of the other plants that we're noticing along the trail. Okay. Sounds great. So make sure that you have your science notebook out with a writing utensil, jotting down what you're thinking, questions that you have. You could even be making sketches and labeling your pictures. Because that's what you're going to post on Flipgrid. All right, let's go. So one of the first plants to um, produce flowers in the spring, which is one of the signs that spring is here, is oso berry or Indian plum. It has these white flowers that droop down and the, the leaves kind of go up. And it's just a great welcoming of spring. Walking down the trail at Swan Creek and seeing the white flowers along the trail, it's a sign that the oso berry plant is uh, starting to produce flowers. And then of course, once the pollinators visit them, the, those flowers will be where the fruits, the berries will develop um, later on in spring. So I definitely wanted to point out oso berry as a plant to look for at Swan Creek. Okay. The other one that we're right next to here is salmon berry. The ones behind us, you can kind of see those magenta flowers. Those are going to attract pollinators as well, like bees maybe some hummingbirds. And where those flowers are, they're gonna turn into these uh, berries that almost look like raspberries. They turn orange, and then they're called salmon berries because they turn a dark red once they're ripe. So if you can beat the birds to them, they're very tasty berries as you're walking trails and see the magenta flowers with orange or dark red berries, you know those are salmon berries, which are a favorite to find here along Swan Creek. I'm noticing that the flowers are different colors and the plants have very different structures. Is that, what, how do those structures help these two different plants survive and thrive here at Swan Creek? Yeah, so especially with the color of flowers, that's gonna be uh, some evidence to which animals pollinate them. So often the brighter flowers are gonna attract pollinators like bees and Often the whitish flowers will attract pollinators like flies or moths. So the different colors of flowers might tell you which pollinators visit them. And so these are two examples of plants that are supposed to be here. We would call those native plants. Exactly, they've been growing in the Northwest for a long, long time and they have relationships with animals. So they depend on each other for pollination and to spread their seeds. And so those are native plants, ones that we like to see here in Swan Creek Park. And so we get to see some examples of some invasive plants as well. Yeah, right along the trail, we're gonna go look at some invasive ones, ones that shouldn't be here, probably because they were introduced. And oh. so they don't necessarily belong here and they might create problems for the people that use the park, the animals that need the park and the plants that are trying to grow here. Okay, let's go see those. All right, so like we mentioned, there are some invasive plants or ones that don't belong in native habitats like these, and they can cause problems for the plant community around here. And a lot of times they're invasive because they spread really easily. They're really good at spreading, and they do that in different ways. This is a weed called bed straw, and it's really sticky. You can, you can stick it to yourself, and so it hitches a ride. Like if an animal were to be walking through, and the little seed balls were out, it would break off, it would stick to the animal's fur, and then it would get tracked so that way it'd spread somewhere else. So bed straw is one that we wanna watch out for because it can kind of smother other plants and spread really easily throughout places like Swan Creek. 
The other weed that I wanted to mention that shouldn't be here is down here. And it has these red stems with hairs on them. And it looks similar to a native plant here called Pacific Bleeding Heart that also grows real low. But this one is called Herb Robert, or as I like to call it, and it's known as Stinky Bob. <laughs> and that is because, especially after you pull it, and thankfully they are easy to pull, but after you pull it you, and get up close, not as much through the mask, thankfully, but it has a really kind of stinky smell. So that's why they call it Stinky Bob. <laughs> and this one can actually uh, eject its seeds, right? So once the seeds are ready to spread and they dry out, they can eject them up to 20 feet. And so invasive weeds are able to thrive because they have things like sticking to you or ejecting them 20 feet or producing thousands of seeds. And that's why we have to be careful about uh, introducing plants or letting them spread in places like, like Swan Creek Park here. We might get more stinky bob. <laughs> so we don't like to see that one. Um, there are others that we like to see, but doesn't necessarily mean that we should be near them. So I'll let Leica talk a little bit about one plant that we find here that we should kind of enjoy from afar. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna look at some nettles or stinging nettles. And so just like the name says, they do sting and if you touch them without gloves or proper equipment, then you might have your fingers be a little sore or a little numb for the next couple of days. So we wanna watch out for it. It is a really great plant though. I'll show you guys down here. Move that guy out of the way. So here's, a, here's the nettle plant. You can kind of see if you get close, you can see all the little spikes. So those are the things that'll, that'll make your fingers go numb. So you wanna watch out for that. But singing nettle are really great because they have a lot of minerals and good nutrients. So some indigenous cultures actually pick the nettle when it's young and they make it into teas or salves. Mm -hmm. And it's really good for things like arthritis or diabetes. And then you can also make it into a pesto if you wanna get fancy. Nettle pesto. <laughs> Nettle pesto on my pasta. Mmm. Mm, yeah. I've heard it's really good. I've yet to try it. We should find a recipe for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. do you have a question on... on uh, I was just going to relay a moment when I have been camping here in Washington and I walked on a path and there were stinging nettles and I didn't realize it and they got my leg and it really did not feel good. Yeah, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as we go further down the path, what else can we expect to see here? Yeah, I think we'll see a couple other invasives. There's a really common one that's Himalayan blackberry. Oh, that kind of plagues everywhere in mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest. So we'll see that one, I think. OK, all right. On the hunt for Himalayan blackberry. So now we've heard that there are plants that are supposed to be here, there are plants that aren't supposed to be here, and there are plants that are supposed to be here but we need to avoid for our own safety. How can we identify all of these different plants so we know what we can pick, what we can't pick, and what to avoid? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when we're looking at plants, sometimes we'll look at things like its branching pattern, like how the stems come out, are they alternate or opposite? We might look at the color of the flowers and the shape of the flowers if they're out, which not a lot are yet. Um, but a lot of times we look at the shape of the leaves. Many leaves have different shapes to them. And so if you learn the terms for what the different shapes are, you'll be able to tell one plant from another. But even that can be hard. And there are a lot of plants out here. So one tool I like to use is an app on my phone called iNaturalist. And that just lets you take a picture of a plant or an animal, like a bug that you're not sure what it is. And if it's a bug you should avoid or not. Mm -hmm. You can take a picture of it and then it will give you suggestions as to what that plant or animal might be from other naturalists in the community. They'll take a look and say, yeah, I agree, this is what you saw. And so you can use the app to be sure what plant you're finding and if it's one you should enjoy, like salmonberry, or maybe avoid, like stinging nettle. So you said it allows other people in the community to agree or disagree with each other. And that's making me think of like a peer review mm -hmm. type of situation where we're not just getting our information from one source, we're getting it from multiple sources. Yeah, that's a good way to do it, especially if you want to be able to eat something or touch something, having multiple people look at it. And then the cool thing is it adds it to the map 
And so that way you can see which plants are growing in your neighborhood. That's a really cool thing. I was gonna ask, how do we know what things are edible? But that's a great way to know because I know some berries are poisonous and you wouldn't want to eat them. Mm -hmm. So it's important to make sure that before you ever eat anything, first you check with an adult, second, you make sure it's edible. Definitely. Okay, so you found something on the ground that you wanted to share with us. What did you find? I did, and this is something I think a lot of kids will recognize. Maybe they know it as helicopter seeds, right? Mm -hmm. We find them on the ground and then we throw them up. This is a Samara from a big leaf maple tree. So it's basically the seed of the maple tree, right? In order to spread oh. and they have wings on them. So earlier we were talking about berries that get eaten and they, maybe they spread that way or plants that eject seeds. Well, some plants are spread by wind and so they have these wings on them to help the seed travel further away from the tree. So it'll pick up, pick up some wind and it'll flow. <laughs> it'll, it'll fly further away and that's how the big leaf maple will spread itself. Well, and I noticed you found it over here by an alder. Right. So it didn't drop from the alder. So it must have flown from maybe over there which we can see some of the maple trees over there. Yeah, exactly. Lots of different trees around here. Some of them are deciduous, right? Mm -hmm. Like the big leaf maple yep. or the red alder. But we also see some um, western red cedar growing around here Yes. in the understory. So we have some evergreen trees growing here as well. So it is really like a forest here in Swan Creek Park. It's a beautiful place. And I'm noticing all the bird songs that are happening. They sound so happy. A bird just hopped behind us a minute ago. There's so much wildlife we can see too. Right across the path, I'm noticing that there's a little hill down to the stream and creek and things look a little bit different down there. So I wanna go check that out and ask Chris and Leica what they're thinking about this area. So I just noticed that down here, there were uh, fewer large trees closer to the water, but also I'm noticing some straw-like stuff on the ground, and I'm just wondering yeah. what that is and why this area is different than what we are just looking at. Yeah, so this is actually a cool site. Um, some people have helped do a little habitat restoration, which means they're planting more native plants or maybe even getting rid of invasives, pulling out all those blackberry. Um, and then all the little mulch, straw-like things that we're seeing is to help cover these plants when they're planted and keep all the water, keep all the moisture in there, and then also to help prevent soil erosion. When the soil's really bare, then the water just comes and takes it and puts it into the river, which sometimes is a good thing, and most of the time it's not. We wanna keep it out. Why do we wanna keep it out? Yeah, great question. We have, this is a salmon bearing stream, so that means we have salmon growing up here and spawning. Um, and so all of the sediment that does end up in the stream can clog up their gills and make it hard for them to breathe. The salmon need really clear, cold water to survive. And why this area for a habitat restoration? Yeah. Like um, why is it important to, to, for the salmon to get rid of invasive species and make sure we have native plants here? Yeah, so native plants do a really good job of holding these stream banks down. And so like we talked about with erosion, we want to avoid the erosion and avoid sediment going in. Mm -hmm. And then they also do a really great job of shading the stream. With all of their foliage branches out and keeps that water cool so that salmon can survive in there. We do a lot of restoration projects at our conservation district too. And so we're always trying to help our salmon habitats and help our populations grow. If students or families wanted to get involved with doing restoration projects, is there a link you can provide us for them to go to to find out where those are happening? Definitely, they can either come through us at the Conservation District or Metro Parks, which operates places like Swan Creek Park. They have volunteer opportunities so people can participate in this kind of work.
Are there any other projects or opportunities for our kindergarten through fifth grade students to get involved and help support our local parks? Yeah, so one thing that we are doing this spring with conservation districts around the country actually is, is promoting the idea of forests and all the good that they do. And one thing that they're doing with that effort is a poster contest. Oh, so neat. artwork from students um, all about healthy forests and healthy communities. So it's a competition for students throughout the country uh, to show off their artwork, but also how much they care about places like this. And Miss Teresa has been teaching us how to draw native species and next art lesson is going to be about plants. So she's getting you prepared for your poster contest. How do they students submit their posters? They're gonna submit it through us at the Pierce Conservation District so they can go to our website and uh, submit their art throughout the year. And then we'll pick winners based on grade level and county and then eventually a winner from our state. Wouldn't that be amazing if one of our students from our TPS TV classroom won that competition? It would be so amazing. And don't worry, friends, we'll make sure your teachers have all the links. So if you want to put in a poster into the competition, we'll make sure they have the information. Now, you were talking about salmon coming to this stream to spawn. Yeah. And then you were talking about how um, you're collecting data from three different locations to decide where to release some salmon. Can you tell us more about that project? Yeah, we have a really exciting project. We're working with the SeaDoc Society and a couple of other community partners and the schools too. So we're, we'll be collecting the data and then sending that data back to the students um, on different things like water chemistry, like how much of different chemicals are in the water, like oxygen or um, other nutrients. And then we'll also be taking like physical characteristics of the stream, like how wide it is or how deep it is and stuff like that. So we can send that to the kids and then they'll decide what site is best for these salmon to be released at. And then they'll be released later in the spring. And where are those salmon right now that are going to be released? Yeah, they're at the Foss Waterway Seaport, right? Hey, yeah. hey, wait a minute. Miss Oslin. Foss Watery Seaport. I think that's where we're going tomorrow on the next episode. Are we going to see the salmon? Do you think we might see the salmon they're going to release here in the stream? That would be neat. We'll have to look Whoa. for them for sure. Okay, we'll make sure we point them out if we find them. For sure. Okay. Okay. We're going to move awesome. along to something else. I want to yeah, find creatures. And we're gonna, we're gonna help. I'm gonna try and uh, pick up a caddis fly if I can find one. Oh, well, I'm not as good as It's kind of shaded, but actually, if you want to look right in there, okay. it'll be it's slower and easier to. Oh, I see something moving. What you see? Oh, the water. I think I found one. You find one too? Yeah. Yep. You got one? Yeah, maybe yours will come out. I don't know. Maybe. That's the thing. Is the... Let's see. They go back into their cases when they're like, moved right. and disturbed. Yeah. Yeah. What are we looking at? These are some caddis so they're hiding in their little shells. They actually, they use all of the things in the stream. So some of them use pebbles, some of them use like pieces of bark or like leaves and dead leaves and things. And they glue it all together and they make a little shell around themselves. Check from maybe some rough waters or predators and things like that. 
And then it crawled back in when you picked yeah, it up. Yeah, I think it got a little scared. It's a strong defense mechanism. Yeah. Popping out. You can kind of see it in there. This is So this is something that a salmon might eat, like a young salmon on its way out to Puget Sound as they're trying to get bigger. Mm -hmm. They would eat macroinvertebrates like caddisfly. Mm -hmm. So we care about them for that reason, that they're part of the food web for salmon. So this is some of the data that we're gonna collect for the fifth graders about Swan Creek because they can tell us how clean the water is based on which macroinvertebrates live here. Because some can handle pollution and some are very sensitive to pollution and this one happens to be sensitive. So if we find a lot of them, that's a good sign for Swan Creek. And so the fifth graders are gonna take a look at what we find and see what they are, identify them, use their observation skills and see what that means for how clean, how healthy Swan Creek is. So this is one that we hope to find a lot of. So you've been talking a lot about salmon. Are there young salmon in this stream right now that are growing up that we just can't see? Yes, there should be. They should be uh, nestled in their reds, which are right. nests of gravel for a few months after they, they were born. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, the adults came back in December Okay. So right about now is when they might start leaving those nests, starting to maybe make their way downstream, looking for food, like this one's moving now. Oh, wow. So there should be a lot of salmon fry in Swan Creek right now, maybe on the hunt for things like this caddisfly in my hand right now. So over the next few weeks, you might see some salmon fry in here. If you looked really close really and close. had your good observation skills on, yep. then uh, yeah, you might find some. I'm thinking like over there where it's kind of calm, I might. Exactly. Yeah, they need pools where they can rest and hide from mm -hmm. predators. We might see ducks, you know, up in the creek yes. and they might be on the prowl for, for the baby salmon. <laughs> A little so. tasty snack. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, caddisfly. Notice how respectful they were, Miss Oslin. I did. So important. Very gently. Very gently. So they had gentle hands when they were touching the mm -hmm. caddisflies. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, macroinvertebrates such as the caddisfly are a good indicator of pollution in our streams and creeks. What would be causing pollution that we would need, be, need to be concerned about for the plants and animals that are native here? Yeah. So the biggest one that we deal with here in the Puget Sound area is stormwater pollution. So that's all of the pollution that comes off of driveways, roads, that uh, comes off of cars, maybe some like leaky oil or other chemicals that we use for brakes even. Sometimes the brake dust will be a pollutant for salmon. And so all of that, it might stay on the road when it's dry, but when it rains, it all gets washed away and down into the drains that you see outside of your neighborhood. You might have seen them, they have like no dumping and they might have a little fish on it. And so that doesn't get treated when it goes back into streams and to the Puget Sound. So we want to do our best to get everything out before it even goes down the drain. So only rain down the drain. Only rain down the drain. Yeah. That's a good reminder. And that's something at home that we can say to ourselves to remind ourselves so that we can protect our local habitat. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay, Tacoma, come visit Swan Creek, but remember to be respectful, which kind of leads, well, before we do that, we need to say thank you. Oh yeah, thank you so much for showing us around Swan Creek. This is amazing. We're hoping to get back when you release the salmon. It's gonna be really cool to see. So fifth graders, we'll work on it. No promises, but we'll see. And it's time for our affirmation. So at the end of our show, we always do an affirmation. Take a deep breath, and then we say something to ourselves that's positive. So our affirmation today is going to be, I am respectful of my environment. Because it's so important to be respectful of all of this nature so we can keep having a beautiful place to live. And it's something that we all can do. 
every single person could be respectful of their environment. So, take a deep breath, everybody. I am respectful of my environment. All right, Tacoma, have a great day. We will see you next time on the TV Classroom. Bye. Bye. seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, you will get bonus points if you find Maui's hook. Five, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Six, use your math skills to see how many points you can get. Good luck.